Who y'all recruiting nation? Chief Totemay here for episode 17 of Uncharted Waters with the one, the only, the people's champ, Admiral James Waters. Today we have an amazing guest with over 29 years of naval experience, arguably the most seasoned and knowledgeable recruiter across the enterprise. He is to CRFs what Nick Fury is to the Avengers. Today with us, we have the National Chief Recruiter, Master Chief Gerald Alchin. Master Chief, thank you so much for joining us oh, today. Thanks for having me. Thanks yeah. for having me, Admiral. Yeah, it's great to have you here. I appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. Master Chief, can you tell us a little bit about your story and how you made it to the National Chief Recruiter? Yeah, for sure. Uh, he came in the Navy, like you said, 29 years ago. Thanks for letting everybody know how old I am. Um, but I uh, joined right out of high school. Uh, came in as a uh, av aviation structural mechanic. Uh, went to boot camp. Went to my first duty station, and uh, it's, it was a squadron BQ4 on Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma. So, um, bastion of the Navy. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, which is the beginning of my story of being in 29 years without ever serving on a ship. So, um, did my time at Tinker Air Force Base. Decided to go recruiting in my hometown of Cleveland, Ohio. Ooh, yeah. Um, went recruiting. Uh, started recruiting back in 2002. Uh, started off as, as a recruiter, recruited for two years um, before I got an opportunity to become a rink. Um, I, I ranked a total of five different stations over three Ooh. years. Wow. Um, converted to uh, career recruiter force uh, back in 2007 and transferred to, uh, at the time, NRD Miami. Um, went down to Miami, ran a station in West Palm Beach when I first got there, um, and got an opportunity to be fleeted up to the uh, DLCPO position of the Fort Lauderdale area. Um, did my three years of DLCPO time there. And uh, while I was there, I made chief, uh, so I was qualified to go down and be an instructor at Noru. So I took uh, instructor duty orders to Noru, started off doing uh, sales training there. Um, back when we did uh, the old sales methodology, PSS, mm -hmm. um, was there for the transition to So that. that's why you always get your way <laughs> sir, I talking got to me Multiple here. sales methodologies, <laughs> multiple techniques to utilize on you, sir. Um, so yeah, mastered PSS, uh, picked up Valor was part of the Valor rollout to the field, um, you know, 10 years ago. And um, got ECR qualified while I was at Noru. Uh, got the opportunity to go be an ACR in uh, NRD New Orleans. Um, did my first year out there as the OACR. Uh, did the next two years as the EACR. And uh, at that time, I was getting ready to transfer, and I was looking at doing another ACR tour. Um, had gotten my CR qualification, but there wasn't any CR gigs available at that time. Um, and they, they called and asked me, they, they said, they're, we're looking for somebody that has uh, Noru experience post-tour ACR that's been pretty successful to go back and be the ACR in Noru. Um, come to find out, I was probably the only person at the time. <laughs> that we're actually looking for you. <laughs> yes. Um, so went back to the uh, schoolhouse, um, was serving there as the uh, ACR and uh, main master chief I was there and eventually fleeted up to the senior enlisted leader mm -hmm. um, before I got the call to go be a uh, chief recruiter, which... Um, for the majority of my time in recruiting was my ultimate goal. Um, so I got that call and they offered me um, NRD Raleigh. Uh, so I, I transferred to Raleigh as the chief recruiter and while I was there we were able to uh, convert it over to NTAG Carolina. Um, did three years there in Carolina um, before uh, getting slated here as the N3 chief recruiter where you oversee the pride shop and plans and policies and, and uh, all of that stuff, primarily focusing on the enlisted recruiting side. Uh, did that job for about a year and the uh, National Chief Recruiter job became available, uh, put in an application for it, and uh, I, got, I got selected by uh, Admiral mm -hmm. Walker. And I've uh, been doing this job for just over two years now, and uh, it, it's been an interesting job, nothing that you would, uh, nothing that you would expect, um, but it's definitely been a blessing to um, be able to be in this position and be able to impact um, recruiting and sailors on a daily basis the way that I'm able to do. Absolutely. Yeah, it's an amazing, it's an amazing role. I mean... Yes, uh, for the recruiters in the field, um, you know, uh, NCR is the primary advisor uh, to me on on uh, how recruiting works, right? The nuances down yes, all the way down to the individual recruiter level, um, because my experience at that level is zero, <laughs> uh, and so I rely on you as well as others that are here. But but uh, you're clearly the the bull recruiter, uh, to be able to give that advice and that sense of what's happening, how are things uh, going in the field, uh, and how are recruiters interpreting the things that, that are coming from here um, to best communicate uh, the changes that yes, we are making. 
So yeah, it's been good. Oh yeah, yeah it's been been a, been a fun ride, fast paced, uh, especially <laughs> the last uh, five months or so. Um, but I yeah. uh, wouldn't trade it for the world. Yeah, it's great. It's great to have you. Good job. So, Mass Chief, in regards to shipping, which is our ultimate goal, as the National Chief Recruiter, what is your vision for debt management? Well, it, it's uh, it's an interesting transition that, that I think that we have to make. We've been really focused on um, building the debt pull up, so we put ourselves in position to have the debt posture um, to make our shipping goal. And, and I think we're, we're getting to that point now. Um, my ultimate vision is to get to the point where, as a nation, We've got, we come into a month with 100% of our shipping seats filled, um, and we have 100% of the shipping seats in the following month filled, um, and then um, kind of stair step down 90, 80, 70, um, so we could get it, get ahead of it, um, and not have to worry about play, replacing too many shippers uh, in month when it, when it becomes very difficult to replace. Yeah, so for those that may not be recruiters that are, that are watching this, so really for my mom, um, <laughs> the DEP is the delayed entry program and it's yeah. normal and natural for a, a future sailor that's contracted to wait some number of weeks or months before they actually ship and during that time there is some you know cultural culturization that's yes, happening i think i just made up that word. <laughs> um, that uh, allows them to be better prepared to go to boot camp yeah, and it allows our team to work with them. That's exactly right, sir. It gives us an opportunity to kind of acclimate them um, to the way that we do business in the Navy, start introducing them to uh, basic concepts, general orders, military time, phonetic alphabet, those types of things yeah. to, uh, to give them a better opportunity for success when they get to uh, RTC. That's right. And this delayed entry program, um, a healthy delayed entry program, is somewhere around 50% of the mission yes, sir. for the year. Right, so if you have a forty thousand mission, uh, having twenty thousand in the delayed entry program um, provides what you articulated, which is we're healthy for the coming month, the month after, and you know fairly healthy, stepping yes. down in percentage yes, as you go into the out months to allow us to just continue to flow uh, future sailors to boot camp. Yes, sir. Yeah, we got so messy. One of the Admiral's key pillars to our success and sustaining success is prospecting. Yes. What's your views on prospecting? Well, anybody that's ever worked with me uh, in the past knows that uh, from, from very early in my recruiting career, I realized that um, prospecting was the key to success um, for every, any recruiter, any, any recruiting station, um, division, you name it. Um, so uh, prospecting has always been near and dear to my heart. Um, just looking at first, making sure you have a good foundation of a, of a good territory breakdown so you can create a strategic prospecting plan to penetrate the right zip codes. Uh, the, the big key for me um, was, was understanding that, um, you know, the more interviews we do, the more people we could put in the Navy, but really backing that up. Um, and, and obviously you have to set appointments, but um, putting those tangible goals in place to put recruiters in position to, to get the appointments. And, and uh, a lot of times it's referred to as your, your upper funnel um, metrics that we're looking for, but um, whether it's attempts, uh, whether it's COIs developed, classroom presentation surveys, but um, really getting the recruiters in the right zip codes at the right time of day, doing the right mode of prospecting, um, so they ultimately could be successful by getting people in the seat to do interviews. Yeah, I think it's really important. Uh, you use the word uh, tangible. I think that's a, a really important concept that when when we ask of recruiters to things. Uh, telling a recruiter to get more contracts is really kind of a nebulous order. Right. Get more contracts, I. Well, there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens before a contract. Right. But when you can get it to a tangible uh, goal of make 50 phone calls or visit three schools, yes, sir. Um, you know, uh, reach out to, you know, so, such and such a number of uh, influencers. Right. Um, you put it into a package that people can actually do. And the reason that's important, I think, is there's a statistical truth that a certain number of those is what's needed yes, to get to an individual contract. And you can't necessarily derive it by a calculation, um, but you do know it through um, empirical data. Yes, sir. Right? And, and I think it also plays a role if you're tracking those, those things um, through self-analysis of the recruiter or through the leadership, you can really start to see what are the strengths 
um, that a recruiter has, what um, prospecting modes work well, um, what are some areas that we can improve upon, and then you can utilize that to get more effective with your prospecting plan moving forward, whether you're leveraging the strengths of the recruiter um, or uh, developing some of those other areas to make them strong across the board. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So, Master Chief, when I checked into recruiting, my first CR stated, stay away from the low-hanging fruit. Right. Focus on the high quality. Can you talk to us a little bit about the quality market penetration vision that you have? Yes, de uh, definitely. Um, a big area of focus that we have across Recruiting Nation right now. Um, obviously, prospecting is the key to success, but if we're not prospecting in the right areas, um, then, then we're going to struggle in some of our high-priority uh, mission categories, specifically Nuke. Uh, warrior challenge, non-nuke sub rates. I think a lot of times it comes down to, um, one, building that strategic prospecting plan, which will put you in the right position. You'll get in your hot zip codes, your high quality zip codes, but then also having the discipline to execute that plan properly and not um, misprioritizing things to take you off of that plan. Uh, and, and just understanding the the big picture of, of uh, Navy recruiting and, and the fact that we, we, we can only put in uh, so many of the lower hanging fruit or the easy to qualify for jobs, uh, we've got to go after that quality. So um, I think most successful recruiters and ranks and DLCPOs have the concept that if we go after quality, everything else is going to kind of fall into place. Okay. Yeah, I think it's really important that recruiters understand from you and from me that um, we're not living in a world where a Cat 4 recruit, and Cat 4 is a lower AFQT Armed Forces Qualifying Test Score uh, future sailor uh, counts the same as uh, a higher right. AFQT or a category one or two or even three uh, recruit uh, because w we have to um, generate that high quality uh, input in order to fill all of the rates. Right. Right. If if we're only prospecting in the in those areas that are generating lower AFQT scores. And I know that some recruiters out there work in those areas and, and you know, God bless you. We need to continue <laughs> to work and, and bring those folks in. But those that have the opportunity to be in the schools that generate right. high AFQTs, that's where we need to be whenever we can because that maximizes the value to the organization because those future sailors have opportunities to be in a wider range of rates. Right. And, and I think um, one misconception that, that I hear a lot in the field is um, there's not a lot of high quality uh, uh, ASFAB scores that are joining the military. Um, but when we look at the data on a whole, about two thirds of the people that join um, one of the branches of the armed forces are a fifth year above QT. So um, understanding one, uh, that, that there is quality out there. Um, and two, in developing that prospecting plan to put put yourself in a position yeah. to be successful. Yeah, that's so true. And and I think that the empirical evidence that we've seen in the last four and a half months, um, I'll give the example of the nuke field recruiting, uh, exemplifies exactly what you're talking about. We were tracking the miss nuke field by a lot. Uh, by changing the incentive, by saying, hey, you get two for one credit for nuke field. In, in a world where we were still recruiting uh, Cat 4, Bravos, and Charlies, the, the lowest end of the AFQT scores, the curve bent precipitously yes. uh, in the upward direction, meaning that with the right incentives, the right uh, guidance, and the freedom, uh, it, it, it combines some of the other things we did to remove friction for recruiters, allowed them to go do the things that they do best in those high-quality markets, right. and we are um, on path uh, to make uh, to to generate the the number of contracts that we had gold for this year for nukes, you know, and and that's just an amazing turn. Yes, sir. Yeah. And we see it in in all of the underlying data as well. Um, looking at our percentage of market take in the fifty and above QTs, the sixty five and above QTs, we're definitely on the rise, um, and, and we're definitely um, ensuring that our recruiters are, are in the right position and have the opportunity yeah. to be successful in those markets. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Ooh, yeah. So, Mass Chief, with high schools and colleges across the enterprise just starting to open, is there any advice that you may have for recruiters out there when it comes to prospecting again for Warrior Challenge, Nukefield? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is don't wait until September to get <laughs> into the schools. Um, we, we should have the school list now, um, and we should start penetrating um, those markets, uh, especially in our high quality, high propensity high schools. Um, first thing we've got to do is we've got to identify 
who's going to be the first future sailor um, that we put in so we could start leveraging that individual um, and, and um, they could start recruiting for us as well in the schools. So getting into schools early, I think, is the number one um, piece of advice that mm -hmm. I would give. A lot of times we wait until, you know, September comes, the schools, they're busy with new students coming in. Um, we can't really start penetrating until October and November. Um, now we're halfway through the school year. So get into school early, utilize the school list that you have, um, and start um, working on that high school penetration now. Yeah, it's, it's about relentlessly yes, sir. Uh, going after that. And you hit on another really important concept in there, which is leveraging those early future sailors. So yes. the delayed entry program uh, generates more future sailors yes. because we're interacting with people that have contracted to join the Navy, and they have friends and brothers and cousins. Yes. And, and so those referrals uh, are great opportunities for recruiters. Uh, and and we have not, because we uh, have had a smaller delayed entry right. program over the last couple of years, uh, that's limited that referral yes. uh, process. And that's something that we just have to embrace as, as the delayed entry program grows. Yes, sir. I agree. So, Mass Chief, across the enterprise, the use of Salesforce varies per intag. What is your threshold for what recruiters should be doing in Salesforce across the enterprise? But my threshold is uh, <laughs> I want everything uh, documented in Salesforce at all times. <laughs> I think it's, uh, it, uh, and I know we're not there yet, um, but I, I think back to myself as a recruiter and as a rank and as a DLCPO, and if I would have had that tool um, where I could have all this data and analysis already completed for me Absolutely. when I'm starting my DPR, uh, I, you know, I, I guess I've made it pretty far as, as, as is, but uh, the, the really it would have made me a lot more efficient, a lot more effective. I think I've uh, been able to provide better quality of life for, my, for myself and for my recruiters and, and my recruiting teams. Um, so uh, I, I think we've got a ways to go, um, but we've got to make sure that we start uh, utilizing Salesforce uh, for everything we do, whether it's building the planners, um, documenting all, all of your activity, um, everything you do. Um, so once again, we can have that data so we can analyze strengths, weaknesses, and make sure that we're, we're in mm -hmm. position to be successful. And it's super important for recruiters to really think through this thing that you just described. Because it can feel like this huge load, mm -hmm. right? All I'm doing is entering data for the, for the man to, and that's, that's me, uh, <laughs> to, you know, to get a warm fuzzy that everything's going okay or not okay. But really... Yeah, there is some truth to, hey, at the Daily Ops Brief here at headquarters, you know, we in the leadership roles get to see how things are going and, and have a sense of it. Right. But it's really for the rink and the DLCPO yes. and the ACR at an NTAG to be able to point the weapon system, right. in this case the recruiter, at the right market, at the right, right target, and it's to the benefit of those recruiters when properly managed, right. the, the leadership team probably managing the data, to it's to their advantage to enter that oh, yeah. so that statistically we see right. where the markets are and we can point them at the right places. Right. Recruiters should not feel alone on an island out there just entering data and nothing coming back to them. Right. If that's what's happening, there's a problem yes, sir. Uh, in that leadership team. Uh, the way it's supposed to work is that provides the opportunity for that for that to hard charge in DLCPO, the rank, the ACR, the CR, yes, to guide the weapon system. And, I, and I'll tell you, I give one example on this. When you talk about the DPR, when you just break down what is a DPR and what are the processes, you've got, you've got to collect and analyze data. Um, you've got to take that data and you've got to identify strengths and areas of improvement, and then you've got to implement um, a process to, to improve on those areas that need to be improved. Um, we've, we've, in the past, we spent a lot of time collecting, we got really good actually collecting data and putting on spreadsheets, um, but we lost some of our, um, some of our, uh, our competency when it came to analyzing the data. Now we're in an environment where as a rank or as a DLCPO, all that data is there provided for you. So that takes the big time consuming piece out of the DPR process. So you can really spend 100% of your time talking about what went right, what went wrong, what are some mm -hmm. things we could do differently tomorrow or next week um, so we can get different results in it. Yeah, yeah makes sense. Oh, yeah. So, Mass Chief, what do you see Recruiting Nation in the next 12 months? Well, I, I think uh, Recruiting Nation is, is going to be on top in the next 12 months. Yeah. I see uh, yeah. us as an organization <laughs> that um, we are, uh, I don't think we've reached our peak yet, um, but I think that uh, one year from now we will be talking about 
we've uh, we've got all of our our goals identified in the debt pool and just working to uh, get them getting them shipped out and um, we're just trying to determine um, whether we're going to have a 25% debt going into uh, the next FY or a 30 or a 35% debt. Um, I, I really believe that we've gained a lot of efficiencies. Um, we've got a lot of new processes in place um, and we're still learning how to leverage them properly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we still continue to grow. Uh, we get even more efficient and more effective and, and, and I really think um, that FY25 has the opportunity um, to be a banner year that, that shows more success than we've seen um, probably um, since I've been recruiting, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I love it. So, Master Chief, as we close out episode 17, what advice do you have to recruit nation? Well, I'd say, uh, you know, number one, I, I realize that it's a difficult job. I'm, I'm one of the only people uh, in the organization that's done all of them. Um, I've been a recruiter, I've been a rank, I've been a deal CPO, an ACR, CR, um, been on staff, been at NORU, uh, and, and have been here in, in the NCR position. Um, I will tell you the one thing that, is, that has carried me and advice that I give to everybody, no matter what position they're sitting in, is um, if you have good work ethic and you apply that um, and you keep a positive attitude, um, then you have a really good shot at being successful. Yeah. Um, there's no arguing that there's going to be good days in recruiting, there's going to be bad days. Um, it's about how you react to those um, and uh, continue to work hard um, and, and do the things that, that uh, your leadership is, is um, trying to get you to do to put you in a position mm -hmm. to be successful. Uh, maintain that positive attitude, and, and, and I think we're going to be good to go. I think we're going to be all right. Hoo yeah, hoo yeah. Hoo Sir, closing remarks? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's been great, NCR, having Thanks you on having this me, episode. Sir. This Appreciate has been fantastic. It. And uh, to the recruiters out there, thank you for what you're doing. I mean, it's been astounding to see the results of, of your work and to, um, you know, tee off of uh, something NCR just said. Uh, I am quite certain we have not reached our full potential. There is still um, energy in the bank uh, to get after this, and uh, I am just so pleased to see us running. So I'm just excited. Booyah, booyah. Recruiting Nation, thank you so much for tuning in to episode 17 of Uncharted Waters with the one, the only, the people's champ, Admiral James Waters. Chief Totemate, out.